This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. All right, this is the uh, third lecture on limited companies. And uh, we're still talking about this capital section of the Statement of Financial Position. Um, and a couple of things I want to deal with. First of all, um, in relation to dividends. So if you're on the next page, I guess I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, uh, but dividends are like drawings are for a sole trader. Uh, uh, a business, a limited company makes profits, um, they'll pay some of that to the shareholders. As I say, it's effectively the drawings, but we call it dividends. Uh, one big difference, of course, is that whereas with a sole trader, the owner can take whatever they want. It's their business. They say, how much do I want this year? 5,000, 10,000, whatever. Uh, with limited companies, when there are lots of owners, the shareholders, you can't have them. One shareholder saying, oh, I want 1,000 this year, and another shareholder saying, I, I only need 100, and so on. Uh, they, they've all effectively got to get the same, or the same dividends based on the number of shares they've got. And so what happens is that the directors will decide or propose how much dividend will be paid. You know, they'll say, how much profit have we made? Uh, generally, they won't want to pay that all out to shareholders because that means paying out lots of cash. And they want to keep some cash to be able to, you know, buy more machines for the business. So they'll say, oh, we've made 10,000 profit. Oh, maybe they'll say, let's propose to shareholders that we'll pay a dividend of 2,000. Now, strictly, these shareholders then vote on that, in theory. Uh, they, they could oppose what the directors suggest, although they tend to always agree. But uh, one little problem is, or not problem, but still, clearly, it's not until the end of the year, when they know what the profit is, that they can actually propose how much dividend they're going to pay. And so we may have made a profit at 10,000 this year and decide we're going to pay a dividend of 2,000, but we won't actually pay it until next year. You know, there's got to be a meeting, the shareholders have to vote. And so as at December, our year end, let's say, profit 10,000, we've proposed a dividend of 2,000, but that will be paid sometime fairly early in the following year. Well, very importantly, dividends are only recorded when they're actually paid. So you'll know that from the last lecture, on the statement of financial position, we're showing the retained earnings, the profits less the dividends. But what we're showing is the profits less the dividends that have actually been paid. If the dividend hasn't yet been paid, if at the end of the year we just propose the dividend, well, it's not recorded anywhere. It's only recorded it only is subtracted from retained earnings. We only pay out the cash in the year the dividend's actually paid. Now, that may sound confusing. You'll see exactly what I mean uh, shortly uh, when we look at um, this little example. Also appreciate, just like drawings, dividends never appear in the statement of profit or loss, just like drawings don't. Uh, the only place dividends will appear is when we're calculating the retained earnings. 
we take the full profits less the full dividends that have been actually paid. And also, I'm not going to write it down, uh, but because we only record dividends when they're paid, if we proposed at the end of this year that we're going to pay a dividend of 2000 we don't actually show it as owing. We don't show a liability on the statement of financial position. Because it's not certain. In theory, things might change. You know, shareholders might vote against it. We only record dividends when they're actually paid. Uh, one last thing before I, I do look at this example, which I hope will then make it all clear. Um, is that many companies, instead of making shareholders wait a year between dividends, you know, at the end of each year, when we know what the profits are, then we say, right, we're going to pay a dividend of 2,000 or whatever. But that would mean shareholders are waiting a year between each dividend. And what many, certainly large companies do, is pay bits of dividend during the year. You know, what they might do is, after six months, they'll look to see, oh, are we doing well, are we doing badly? And they'll say, right, we'll pay a small dividend halfway through the year. At the end of the year, when we know what the profits are, then we'll propose the rest of the dividend. Well, dividends paid during the year, we call an interim dividend. paid during the year. You usually keep that fairly small uh, because, you know, things may go wrong and the profits may not be as high as we expect. But at the end of the year, when they know what the profits are, there'll be a final dividend. It's proposed at the end of the year. But as I said a few minutes ago, it won't be paid at the end of the year. Uh, there won't have been time, you know, by the time we know the profits. Only then can we decide on the final dividend. So that will, the actual payment will be over the following year. All right, let me put all that together with uh, an example. Look at example two. A company has a year end of 31st December each year. On the 1st of March, they paid a final dividend for the year ending 31st December 2016 of 5,000. So this dividend, at the end of last year, when they knew what the profits were, they'll have proposed a dividend of 5,000. But as I was saying, uh, they won't be paying it until sometime early in 2017. It was paid on the 1st of March. On the 5th of July, they paid an interim dividend for this year, for the year ending 31st December 2017, of 1,000. Uh, and then on the 31st of December 2017, when they know what the profits of the year are, they've proposed a final dividend of 6,000. We're required to state the effects of each of these dividends in the financial statements for the year to 31st December 2017. Well, first of all, in the statement of profit or loss, there'll be nothing. We never show dividends in the statement of profit or loss. In the statement of financial position, The divid we won't show any dividends separately in the statement of financial position, but the retained earnings. I keep writing it earrings. The retained earnings uh, will be reduced by the dividends actually paid. 
And how much have they paid? On the 1st of March they paid 5,000. All right, it happened to be a dividend from last year's profits, but that's irrelevant. Uh, it's only recorded in the year it's actually paid. Uh, also, it, uh, during this year, on the 5th of July, they paid the interim of a thousand. It was paid this year, it's recorded this year. The proposed dividend hasn't been paid, it's not recorded. And so it will be reduced by the total of 6,000. They proposed a dividend of 6,000. The proposed dividend appears nowhere in the statement. Nowhere. Uh, shareholders will be informed about it, but nowhere in the statement of financial position does the proposed dividend appear. Uh, no dividends appear in the statement of financial position as a separate item. It's simply when we're calculating the retained earnings, as I went through in the previous lecture, when we're calculating retained earnings, uh, we subtract the dividends paid during the year regardless of which year they relate to. All right, I said I want to do a couple of things in this lecture. If you turn over, the next heading is reserves. And I already told you in the last lecture, uh, reserves is anything extra owed to shareholders above the share capital. And the only one we've seen so far, the most obvious reason why we own more, is retained earnings. Well, that's also known as a revenue reserve. And a revenue reserve can be paid out, or the word is distributed, as dividend. So, for example, if on our stem to financial position we had share capital, of 20,000 and we have retained earnings of 10,000 which remember I don't know how long this business has uh, been going but that 10,000 is all the retained earnings they've ever made all the profits they've ever made less all the dividends that have been paid out well that 10,000 can be paid out as dividend uh, most companies won't, because it means paying out cash and they want the cash to buy new machines. So most companies won't pay it all out, but legally they can pay a dividend of up to 10,000. Uh, which isn't just this year's profits, it's all the retained earnings they've ever made. Legally, that can be paid as dividends, the maximum they could possibly pay. Uh, share capital cannot be paid out as dividend. So even though shareholders are owed in total 30,000, the most they could possibly be paid is 10,000. They can't be repaid the share capital unless the company completely closed down and had made sure they paid off all the liabilities first. Now, I did mention that uh, about reserves before, uh, but I also said there are two other reasons why shareholders might be owed extra above the share capital. And the first one relates to the issue of shares.
Uh, and to explain uh, the entries, the effect of an issue of shares, uh, rather than read all that business to you, look at example three. A company is formed on the 1st of January 2015 and issues 10,000 50 cent shares at a price of 50 cents each. Uh, now, two things there. The, the way it works, you know, we may be forming a company. Uh, and I've done some budgets. I think, oh, perhaps we need 5,000 to get the company going, you know, to buy some machines and whatever. So I need 5,000. Uh, I've got, I've got a group of uh, friends and I say, right, we need 5,000. And, you know, one friend says, oh, I can afford to put 100 in. Another friend says, I can afford to put 1,000 in and so on. And so what I've decided to do here is I'm issuing 10,000 shares of 50 cents. And they'll all get a certificate, and the certificate has to have printed on it the value of the shares. And it can be whatever we like. You know, I said I wanted 5,000. Well, 10,000 50 cent shares will give me 5,000. I could have said, oh, the one dollar shares and issue five thousand one dollar shares, whatever we want. I've decided that we'll have 50 cents printed on them. That 50 cents is the amount printed on the share. These days, a lot of it's done electronically, but you still get companies issuing certificates. Because... Um, you know, somebody can afford a hundred dollars, they say, all right, I'll, I'll buy 200 shares. And we give them a certificate saying you own 250 cents shares. Now, uh, the amount printed on the share is also called the nominal value. Or the par value. So if you ever, and you will in the exam, see the words nominal or par value, it's the amount that's printed on the share. And what are we doing? It says we formed it, we issued 10,000 50 cent shares. It may seem a silly thing to say, you'll see why though later. We're going to charge 50 cents. Which I say it may seem obvious, but you'll see why it's not quite so obvious shortly. So how much do we receive? 10,000 shares, 50 cents, 5,000. And so the double entry, we simply debit cash, 5,000. And what would we do if it was a sole trader with credit capital, 5,000? Well, same here, except we call it share capital. So absolutely no problem, just like a sole trader, easy. However, look at part B. The same company has decides to issue more shares in June 2017, two years later. And we're going to issue another 20,000 shares. Well, they have to be the same sort of shares. So what I mean is, the shares we've already issued have 50 cents printed on them. They're 50 cents shares. So they're going to issue another 20,000 50 cents shares. However, the first 10,000 were issued when the company was first formed and we charged 50 cents. The shares paid 50 cents. We're now issuing more shares, but it's two years later. And, and the company's quite likely to have made a lot of profit by then and be a lot bigger. And if the business has grown in value, it would seem only fair that if 
people want to buy more shares, they should pay a bit more than 50 cents. We can charge what we like for the shares. It can't be less than the amount printed on it. It can't be less than 50 cents. But surely, if the company's bigger, why not get people to pay a bit more? And we charge whatever we like. We charge whatever we think shareholders will pay. And they've decided to issue them at a price of 80 cents each. Now, I'll explain why they may charge more, but, you know, you'll be told in the exam what they charge. And I say again, although they must have an amount printed on them, the nominal or par value They, uh, the price for the shares can be anything they want, but it can't be less than the par value. It can't be less than 50 cents. And so how much cash is received? Uh, there's 20,000 shares. If they're charging 80 cents each, they're receiving 16,000. And so, fine, we will debit cash 16,000. But where are we going to credit? Before we credited share capital, that was fine. And remember, these are 50 cents shares. There were 10,000 shares, 50 cents each, 5,000. We've issued more shares. We will credit share capital. But we credit share capital with the nominal value. And what's the nominal value? We're issuing 20,000 more shares. They're 50 cent shares, so 20,000 at 50 cents is 10,000. <coughs> but what about the other 6,000? The other 6,000 is the extra 30 cents that they were having to pay for each share. We credit that to a new account called share premium account. And the share premium, there were 20,000 shares. The premium is the extra of the share uh, the price we charge over the nominal value. And so they were charging 80 cents, the nominal value was 50 cents. The premium is the extra 30. 20,000 at 30 is 6,000. And so the double entry does work. We've debited cash 16. We've credited share capital 10, share premium 6, a total of 16. But it has to be kept like that. Uh, the share capital account must show the nominal value of the shares, the amount printed on them. And again, they have 10, another 20, they've now 30,000 50 cent shares. 30,000 50 cents is 15,000. Anything extra they've paid for the shares has to be shown separately. Uh, it's share premium. And on the statement of financial position, under the heading capital, or another word for it when it's a limited company, is equity, we show the share capital. Fifteen thousand. Again, that's the nominal value of all the shares that are now in issue. There were ten, and the twenty. There are thirty thousand fifty cent shares. Fifteen thousand. And in addition, the share premium. Six thousand. So the total owing to shareholders is twenty one thousand. 
sorry, that cash was 16,000, I'm sorry. But the total owed to Shells is 21,000, which is correct, surely. They'd paid in 5,000 uh, when the first shares were issued. They paid another 16,000 when the second lot of shares were issued. Shells have paid in 21,000, they're owed 21,000. But we have to split between the share capital, the nominal value, and the share premium, anything extra that's been paid. Uh, in addition, of course, there are bound to be retained earnings. We don't know what they are. Earnings. We've dealt, said enough about retained earnings, but share premium. It's money owed to shareholders, you know, 21,000 in total is what they paid in. But it's the extra paid in over and above the nominal value. Uh, and so that's another example of a reserve. Remember again, a reserve is anything extra owed to shareholders above the share capital. So share capital is 15, they're owed extra because of retained earnings, they're owed extra because of um, this share premium. However, this 6,000 is called a capital reserve. A capital reserve cannot be distributed as dividend. Because effectively, it's the same as share capital. You know, although we're required to show the 15 and the 6 separately, when they bought shares, they paid in 21,000. It's effectively all capital. And so just like share capital, share premium cannot be paid out as dividend. Shareholders can only get that money back if the company completely closes and has paid off all its liabilities. A capital reserve. Retained earnings is a revenue reserve. That's profits earned. That can be paid out as dividend. Share premium. A capital reserve. It cannot be paid out as dividend. All right, well, again, I'm going to pause the lecture, otherwise it gets too long. Uh, the next lecture, though, is something that's almost certain to be asked more than once in the exam. Um, it's two special ways in which shares might be issued, something called rights issues, bonus issues, but that's the next lecture.